The Canary Isles, belonging to Spain, consist of seven bigger and six smaller islands, spreading over a more than 7,500 square kilometer area in the Atlantic Ocean. Due to their location, the islands have always been an important stage of shipping traffic between Africa, Europe, and America. The biggest island is Tenerife. Its capital city, Santa Cruz, takes turns as capital of the isles with Las Palmas on Gran Canaria. In the bed of the Santos Creek, water trickles only two months of the year. In fact, lack of water is one of the major problems of the islands, which is being solved by building reservoirs. That's why local people's endeavor to beautify their towns by landscaping and planting alleys deserves credit. The biggest square of Santa Cruz, the Plaza de España, Spain Square, has also been beautifully parked. The huge group of statues dominating the square commemorates the victims and heroes of the Spanish Civil War. The famous sculptor, Juan Avalos, made the artwork to the order of General Franco. Its main character is an angel symbolizing freedom and a monk drawing the attention of divine powers to the war dead. The monument is guarded by naked giants leaning against their swords. At the beginning of the walking street that starts from the square stands the famous statue of Canove, the triumph of the Virgin of Candelaria, which was created by the famous master in 1788. The Blessed Virgin holds an infant in her right and a candle symbolizing light in her left hand. This is the center of the city, the Parliament, as well as the Iglesia de la Concepción, which is the oldest church of the city, is very close from here. The Perez Galdos Theatre, with its perfect acoustics, functions as an opera house and a concert hall. The classical building is decorated with Andalusian motifs. The biggest hall of the city is the Fruit and Flower Market, named after the African Our Lady. A flea market is held in front of the marketplace every weekend that could be interesting also for foreign visitors. The facades of old houses are decorated with carved wooden galleries which are particularly characteristic of the architecture of the island. The capital city is proud of its exotic exuberant green parks of which the most beautiful may be the botanical garden named after the former mayor Garcia Sanabria. The flora of the winding promenades is like a jungle. A wide range of plants, from palms to blooming tropical bushes, live here. Floral clocks and fountains are a frequent ornamentation here. Las Terracitas, near San Andres fishing village, is well known for the fact that in 1975, four million sacks of Saharan sand were taken here to turn black volcanic gravel into golden yellow sand. Candelaria is a well-known place of pilgrimage. The little wooden sculpture of the island's patron saint the Virgin of the Candela, was cast ashore here in 1390. To commemorate the event, a Dominican monastery was erected here. The monumental cathedral with an octagonal apse, portico, airy wooden balconies and a characteristic bell tower ending in a dome built in 1958 stands on this place today. The coastal promenade of Candelaria is surrounded by nine sculptures of Guanche chieftains. Los Cristianos used to be a little fishing village, and the prettiness of past ages can still be tracked here. Yet, the little town is on a fair way to become the tourist center of Tenerife. 
Everything was built in favor of the tourists here. Luxurious hotels, terraced restaurants, shopping streets and shopping malls, casinos, bars and discos. Interminable lines of apartments run along the coastal promenades lined with palm trees. Apart from apartments, which can be rented for a short or longer period or purchased, several hotels can be found on the tourist resorts of the southern coast. From one to five stars, every category is on the palette. Residential houses to rent, however, are much rarer than in other countries. Furthermore, camping is not fashionable at all on the Canary Islands. Most of the pleasure boats leave from the harbor of Los Cristianos to, for instance, the rock world of Los Gigantes or to Masca Bay. There are dolphin and whale watching tours to take photographs, diving excursions and fishing tours. Moreover, huge ferries also leave from here to La Gomera, El Hierro and La Palma. Playa de las Americas is well named. The atmosphere of the luxurious holiday resort invokes Florida or California. The scenery-like buildings provide us with numerous sights and tourist attractions. For example, the balloon, launched every quarter hour, from where we can view the whole town. The lines of hotels and apartments run from the beach straight to the town center, broken with shops and entertaining facilities. There are several factors contributing to the popularity of the Canary Islands. Besides civilized, arranged cities, well-built beaches also attract tourists. Pleasant weather is not negligible, nor is the hospitality of local people. And don't forget about the Free Trade Act of Queen Isabel, which made the area a custom-free zone. This didn't change after joining the European Union, so we can enjoy low prices and the convenience of paying in euros at the same time. The diversity of architectural styles is simply fascinating. The amazing mosaics of the shopping mall reflect the effect of the Viennese buildings of Hunderwasser, yet as if the spirit of Gaudi were slinking here. Like Las Vegas, where a prospering city was created out of the desert, Tenerife, suffering also from a lack of water, is also proud of its little pools, gargoyles, and fountains decorating the town. The Pyramidal Congress Center, decorated with rows of statues, gives home to a casino and a theatrical auditorium. In the latter flamenco evenings, parades and shows are presented. Of course, the building also has a hotel equipped with a swimming pool and tennis court, so participants of the congresses organized here have everything they need. The 3,718 meter high Pico del Taide is the highest mountain not only in Tenerife, but in all of Spain. Its snow-capped peak has always been an astonishing view above the tropical landscape and palm trees. It's of scientific interest that Halley's Comet was discovered by a French astronomer with a telescope set on the Pico del Taide. It must have been very difficult to set up an observatory here, since until 1975 only donkeys were used here for cargo transport. The high quality blacktop was built at that time. We're still far away from the peak, but the serpentine up there offers an amazing view. The bottom of the sky around is wreathed by characteristic African clouds, while the island of Gomera is enshrouded in the fog in the distance. At our feet, we can see the Canadas Canyon. It is, actually, the place of a crumbled ancient mountain that exploded due to a volcanic eruption before the formation of Teide. The walls of the 45 kilometer wide crater are 400 to 500 meters high. The clouds, blown by trade winds, hit the mountainside and warm up, forming precipitation. Therefore, on the right side of the island, the sky is often cloudy, while on the left side, we can calmly take pleasure in the sunshine. Snow melts only in the hottest summer months on Taida. Even the wind is stronger than down. Those who go there should take shoes and warm clothes to this excursion. 
Moreover, sometimes non-skid chain is also necessary for the car. Taida National Park was opened in 1954. Since then, a park guard and a mountain rescue team have been operating here. We can go by car to the 2,356 meter high Los Roquillos. From that point, a cable railway takes over. When the weather is nice, the two and a half kilometer long journey can be taken in cabins for 33 people. In the thin air of the mountain station, there is only a 163 meter long walk to the peak. The Valle de Ucanca Plateau on the way down the mountain is a lunar landscape. Spanish and American filmmakers shot westerns and fantastic films here. Puerto de la Cruz, the harbor that was established for transporting wine in 1648, is the third biggest city on the island. However, from the point of tourism, it outshines even the capital city. Its popularity is unbroken, despite the fact that it's situated on the northern side of the island, where the weather is more frequently cloudy and rainy than in the southern tourist resort. Puerto de la Cruz is one of the most popular holiday resorts of the entire Spain. Its hotels can accommodate the multiple of the 45,000 strong local people. Due to the favorable tax and credit system, a lot of foreign people buy flats for themselves here. The majority of them spend only two or three months here and rent the property out for the rest of the year. The incoming rent covers the monthly payment of the loan. The city is characterized by elegance and luxury. The beaches stretching far along the coast reach the neighboring settlements too, making them part of the complex holiday resort. The little coastal fortress, St. Philippe, was built of massive stones. Once it was used to combat pirates, William Blake, Sir Jennings, and Admiral Nelson, who, besides the battle, also lost his arm at Santa Cruz. Nowadays, an amazing view opens up from the fortress to the beaches. Because of the stony, rocky soil and the heavy surf, bathing is not a really pleasant experience here. Those who have more experience don't swim here, but in Lago Martinez swimming pool zone and leave the ocean to surfers and fishermen. The most photographed building of the city is the little white church, the St. Telmo Chapel. The name of Cesar Manrique, architect, has been famed for Jaemos del Agua, the complex building of the lookout tower, swimming pool, and restaurant and the cave that can be found on Lanzarote. Instead of traditional swimming pools, he designed dull-edged, amorphous, artificial lakes, of which the biggest is 15,000 square meters. There are some islands on the lakes with bridges to lead there. Several facilities, sauna, solarium, bubble bath, and a wide scale of places of entertainment can be found in the park that's planted with tropical plants. Puerto de la Cruz could take pride in some beautifully renovated monumental buildings hiding among the new houses. The Church of Nuestra Señora de Pena de Francia stands on a square planted with tropical trees. The three-nave church from the 12th century is one of the most wonderful pieces of Baroque architecture on the island. A Plaza del Charco is the biggest square of the city. The surrounding houses have become altered to restaurants, cafes, and terraces, were opened in front of the buildings, sometimes even under the trees of the square. Especially, the evening is a very busy and lively period. The intimate little restaurants offer local specialities, tapas and paella. Among the houses, an intimate fishing port operates. Loro Park is the liveliest zoo of the Canary Islands. 
An enormous sum of money and work has been put not only in the structuring, but also in the popularization. The name itself can be a little deceitful. There's much more to it than introducing 230 types of bujarigars. We can find several wild animals, such as gorillas, tigers, leopards, and crocodiles on the five hectare jungle-like area. The pavilion, furnished for the dolphins, is a unique attraction. The intelligent, friendly dolphins are not only the children's favorites. It's a gruesome experience to watch the bloodthirsty crocodiles from up close. The palm house is the home of orchids and other exotic flowers. The aquarium is also a breathtaking sight, as if we took part in a real deep sea dive. The parrots want to prove that they're not only nice and colorful. The seals fascinate their audience with lively shows every two hours. The former fishing villages near Los Gigantes and Playa de San Juan to Puerto de Santo have completely merged into one another, providing the tourists with comfortable hotels and sandy beaches. A lot of wealthy people visit the area of Los Gigantes by boat. Many of them have also bought a house here, in case the weather turns stormy. Behind the holiday homes creeping up the steep hillsides above the harbor rise the cliffs of giants menacingly. The barren cliffs of the Tenno Mountain, sometimes falling vertically into the sea, are 500 meters high. The sea is 2,000 meters deep at their foot. Dolphins and whales like living here. Their presence is also alluring for visitors who rarely see wild dolphins. Despite its name, Gran Canaria is not the biggest one of the isles. It was simply the biggest island discovered at the time it was named. Its capital city, Las Palmas, with its 400,000 inhabitants, is the biggest city of the isles. The part of the city situated south of the river Guiniguada is the old town. This is the commercial district of Las Palmas. The chapel, as well as the highly controversial kiosk, stand on the square of San Telmo. It's an ideal meeting place. The busiest shopping street of the city, Calle Mayor de Triana, starts from here. Every kind of business can be found here. Elegant little shops and huge shopping malls. We can watch the shop windows along more than one kilometer, and in case we get tired, there are plenty of benches and cafes on the way. We can have ice cream or simply a fast snack in one of the inevitable fast food restaurants. Nothing can set limit to the shopping. Our bank cards are accepted everywhere, and although banks close at two in the afternoon, Automatic teller machines provide cash day and night. The most remarkable building of the old city is the Casa de Colón, or the House of Columbus, which, contrary to its name, has never belonged to Columbus. It was the palace of Pedro de Vega, the governor of the island. 
Columbus spent four weeks here as a guest of the governor when one of the three ships constituting his fleet, the Pinta, was damaged and was repaired in the harbor of Las Palmas. The interesting sight of the symmetrical house is that all its doors and windows are different from each other. The wooden balcony and a prominent little terrace, screen and window shutter, lead glass and mosaic, gothic stone frame and wrought iron bars, and carved ornaments. There is a lot to admire. The biggest ecclesiastical building of Las Palmas is the Santa Ana Cathedral. The three-neve church with the two tower bells, like other cathedrals, took several centuries to build. When the work began, Gothic was the dominating style. However, by the time it was completed, Classical became fashionable. The front facade is the work of the famous local architect, Lujan Perez. Opposite the cathedral stands the palace of the city hall, which is also of classical style that has been used only for representational purposes for a long time. On the square between the two buildings, three full-sized dog statues lie on their stomachs. It's probable that the name Canary comes from the Latin canis, or dog. The St. Francisco Fortress is younger, but the Las Palmas Fortress is much bigger. It was built to prevent the attackers who might pass beyond the La Luz Fortress. The Dutch attack in 1599 was an example of this. Canary Village was built up in Doramas Park. According to the designs of Nestor de la Torre, in one group of buildings, as an outdoor village museum, it was designed to present everything that's nice and interesting in the architecture of the island. The houses embrace a paved square, planted with palms, which is, at the same time, the terrace of the restaurant operating here. At the other end of the square, in the former house of de la Torre, the ideal Gran Canaria is exhibited, dreamt of by the artist whose early death prevented him from making the dreams come true. Arucas is the third largest city of the island. Here stands the church named after John the Baptist, which has become the symbol of the whole island. The church, which is amazing even in its confliction, tells us about the glorious days of Gothic, its lanceted windows, thick colonnades, gateway offering the feeling spatiality, salient balconies, sculpture ornaments, are reminiscent of the Notre Dame. The square with flowers and houses framing it provide a contrast to this masterpiece of the early 20th century. Steep serpentines, broken with hairpin bends, lead up to the nearly 2,000 meter high peak of the island. We have to clamber to heights of 600 to 800 meters, even near the coast. The view compensates us for the fatigue. Even a resting place for divers has been built at the most beautiful points. This scene is amazing. The mountain air is sharp and clear, and the sky is sparkling blue. The steep rocks play in the different shades of yellow, brown, gray, red, and black. In the cracks of the rocks, bushes with yellow flowers are in full bloom. Wild flowers and little palm trees grow in the lower part. Upper in the mountains, pine trees and evergreen bushes take over the power. However, several kinds of cactuses can also live here. We pass over little mountain villages, and we can soon take a glimpse of the most interesting member of the fancifully scalloped rocks, the Bentayiga monolith. Santa Lucia, the little friendly mountain town, is remarkable for the fact that this was the place where the Guanches and the Spanish joined battle with each other. The popular restaurant, the Hau, was born in the style of the local architecture. Everything which has been found of the personal belongings of the Aborigines was exhibited here. Artificial lakes have been created in the valleys for storing valuable fresh water.
Roque Nublo, the black monolith balancing above the precipice, can easily be seen from the rest area and lookout tower next to the road. If we wound further along the road, we would reach the peak, Pico de los Nieves, very soon. It's not worth going on, though. The most beautiful view waits for us in Cruz de Tejeda. The village was given its name after the old stone cross erected here. Teita, the peak of Tenerife, the highest mountain of Spain, which is snow-covered all year long, can also be seen in clear weather from the terrace of the restaurant. The harbour of Mogan allures us with its unique style white houses fully covered by blooming flower parade, narrow lagoons, terraced restaurants and cafes. Considering the number of yachts swinging in the bay, not in vain. Here we can rent every kind of watercraft, from paddle boat to luxurious yacht. Moreover, cruises leave from here too. For instance, to see the wild dolphins. What else could be more romantic than sailing in the sunset than having a candlelight dinner with champagne in one of the terraces of the harbour? According to the survey of Thomas Whitmore, of which locals are very proud, the residents of Gran Canaria are fortunate in living under the most pleasant climate of the world. Canary Island are called the Islands of Eternal Spring, which is, of course, understandable, since the average temperature in summer is 24, and in winter is 18 degrees Celsius. The average annual rainfall is 50 millimeters from June to September. However, there is not a drop of rain. The number of sunny hours reaches 10 a day in June and July, and eight hours in April, May, August, and September. Talking about pre and post season is irrelevant on the islands. We can talk about peak and non-peak season. It's always worth visiting the place for some reason. For example, for the famous carnivals and fiestas. There's a festival, cultural event or religious celebration every month. The detailed programs can be found in guidebooks or on the internet. The protected bay of Puerto Rico is the training camp of the Spanish National Sailing Team, as well as the home of beginner or advanced surfers and yachtsmen. It's a real water sport, fishing and diving center, with a big yacht harbor and an artificially filled sand beach. The formerly barren, steep rock walls are not even visible owing to the terraced hotels and apartments creeping up the mountains. The houses crowd in four or five lines between the water and the rocks. Like anywhere else on the island, building fever has grown to huge dimensions. A self-generating spiral of prosperity created by tourism can be seen everywhere. More money makes it possible to build hotels and new buildings, redecorate old ones, landscape the area, and build roads. This attracts even more tourists, who bring even more money, and so on. Who knows for how long? The pleasure resort built in the valley of Torito can be used by everyone, but of course, mainly the guests of the four surrounding hotels go there. Like Loro Park on Tenerife, Palmitos Park strives to show plants, palms and cactuses, as well as animal species native to the islands on Gran Canaria. In the 20-acre park, 
which was built in Barranco de Fataga Canyon near Mas Palomas, mainly the botanical garden is highlighted. 45 kinds of palms and 160 kinds of cactuses can be found here. There's also an orchid park and a butterfly farm. In the huge aquarium, 150 kinds of fish species swim. The site is made even more colourful by 1,200 birds. Mas Palomos and Palaya de Ingles, the two holiday resorts that have grown together by now, are the centre of tourism and beach life on the island. Most of the entertainment and sport facilities are concentrated here. There are slide parks and a fun fair, sport tracks, gaming rooms, hotels and shops. After dinner, the period of walking and shopping begins, but pubs and bars do not remain empty either. The old lighthouse, which gave its name to the nearby hotel and shopping mall, can be found in the direction of Posito Blanco. Panorama Promenade begins at San Agustin, and along the six kilometer long sandy beach of Playa del Inglés that turns into the sand dunes of Mas Palomas unnoticeably. The beach can be admired from a bird's eye view. Or by telescope. The strangest natural formation of Gran Canaria is the 4.5 kilometer long desert spreading here. Sand has been blown in from the Sahara 250 kilometers away from here. The ever-changing wind-blown sand dunes remind us of a real desert. The dunes show a different image in the morning under the ferocious rays of the midday sun and in the light of the sunset. It's no wonder people like walking, taking photos, sunbathing, or simply lying on the sand. The little desert is a nature conservation area. However, newer and nicer hotels are being built with renewed effort in the vicinity. Self-supplying apartments equipped with a kitchen are the most popular and the cheapest among tourists. The majority of the hotels at the beach represent the luxury category. The most expensive and most elegant are the paradores, which were created in old cottages or castles. Besides silence and tranquility, they sometimes offer the possibility of riding a horse and a camel too. In smaller number, we can find some youth hostels and campsites as well. 
Fuerteventura is the second biggest member of the Canary Islands. However, it's the most sparsely populated at the same time. Volcanic eruptions, the sand coming from the Sahara 100 kilometers away, and the rainless 19th century weather destroyed the economy. Recovery was brought a century later by the appearance of tourists who gladly visit Fuerteventura for its silence, tranquility, and intactness. The cool wind, called Gota Fria, often blows at the coast of the islands. This wind, and the waves lashed by it, attract surfers. Fans of the new sport kite also join them. Rich underwater world allures divers while the undulated inside of the island is the favorite of bikers and hikers. Those who love the sun can find long stretching sandy beaches on the eastern side, while the southern coast hides some romantic rocky bays that are difficult to approach. The latter is the favorite of boatmen. The group of islands is the most dynamically developing region of Spain that has turned from a peripheral area into a holiday paradise, able to take 7 million tourists a year. The aborigines of the island were guanches of quite obscure origin. They were tall, European-type men with fair hair and blue eyes. They used to live in caves that can be seen chiefly at Galdera in Gran Canaria and Canobio de Valeron. They hunted, wore furs, decorated their bodies with stamp imprints, and painted geometrical forms on the walls of their caves. They dealt with herding, and due to lack of metal, they made their tools of stone or bone and embalmed their dead. The first description of the Guanches comes from the pen of Boccaccio, who rewrote the notes of a Genovese seaman. Jean de Betancourt, the Norman adventurer hired by the Castilian mercenary army, started to conquer the islands in 1402. Aboriginal people, according to ecclesiastical traditions, were converted to Christianity by force, and those who did not want to adopt Christianity were mercilessly massacred. It took another 95 years for the conquistadors to finally defeat the last of the Guanches. The few remaining Aboriginal people gradually mingled with the mainly Spanish and Portuguese inhabitants. By the time the famous scientist Alexander von Humboldt began to study them, there was very little information straight from the horse's mouth to count on. The Guanches, according to many researchers, were the survivors of Atlantis. In ancient times, this area was called Over the Pillars of Hercules. This referred to the present-day Strait of Gibraltar, and it meant that the area over it was unknown for the other part of the world. Could the lack of concrete information and crumbs of records of travelers have been completed by the fantasy of the poet? Could the island of the happy, the Elysian fields, or the garden of the Hesperides be part of the state we call Atlantis today? Did this empire ever exist at all? If so, is this the place we have to search for it? Despite the enormous amount of research published so far, the questions still outweigh the answers. The evidence that could mean the breakthrough is still missing. Actually, is it a wonder? According to the legend, due to a volcanic eruption, Atlantis was covered by lava, then the continent-sized island was sunk into the depths by an earthquake. Only the highest peaks extrude from the ocean. These are the present-day Azori, Cape Verde, and Canary Islands. If there's anything to research, it's hidden among these islands deep in the ocean. The detailed bibliography of the topic is so long that it could reach from one island to the other.
Antigua is one of the oldest cities of Fuerteventura. It was established by Norman settlers in 1485. They brought windmills in order to irrigate the islands on which they grew crops and fodder plants. They raised animals such as goats and sheep. Antigua, on the occasion of the 370th anniversary of its foundation, was made the capital. Before that, Betancoria, and after that, Arequife, received this privilege. The white church of Nuestra Señora de Antigua, with wooden vaulted and stone framework decorated with folk motifs, originates in this time. The fortress of Gran Tarajal was built in Norman times when the conqueror Jean de Betancourt invaded the island with his troops. The town created around the fortress has become the second biggest city by the 20th century. The beach of the city, Las Playitas, covered by black sand, is very popular among visitors. In contrast to the beach of Las Playitas is the snow-white stripe of Jandina Peninsula. This is the longest coast of the island. The summer heat is eased by light breeze, which fills the sails at the same time. On the peak of the island, at the foot of the lighthouse in Punta de Jandina, stands the biggest caravan park of Fuerteventura, the home of 21st century nomadic people. During the Second World War, the whole area was the private property of General Franco's friend, Gustav Winter, German factory owner. The local hearsay has been whispering about a German submarine base and stolen Nazi treasures hidden under the sea for more than 60 years. This area seems desolate even today. Only some graveled roads link the little, silent settlements. Cofete has only one restaurant, and a two-kilometer-long narrow path leads to the coast. Fuerteventura was discovered by travelers later than Tenerife and Gran Canaria. The weather is a bit more austere. Building up infrastructure and increasing tourism is a bit slower. However, those who visit the place prefer silence and tranquility. Moreover, the intactness of nature that can be found only at a very few places by those who want to escape from civilization. Smaller members of the Canary Islands, Fuerteventura, Lanzarote, and Gomera, La Palma, and El Hierro, are oases like these. More outdoor village museums can be found along the way back to Betancuria. They show us the ancient folk architecture of the islands. In some of the redecorated farmhouses, little exhibitions were set up of the personal belongings of farmers and ranchers. There are some places where a little park showing partly native animals completes the village museum, others where art craft demonstrations are held but restaurants offering local specialities are also sought after by tourists. Those who have not had the opportunity to visit an Arabic country yet can try riding a camel in the hot sand of one of the cactus plantations here.
Windmills characterize all of Spain, and the islands are no exception. The Knight of Sorrowful Face of Cervantes also met them. The most romantic in appearance is called Molino. Crops used to be milled in it. The Molina is different from it because it's not a separated building. Its blades were fixed to the flat roof of the house, and the grinding machine was in the house. The windmill fixed to the top of the tower is a later invention, suitable for both generating electricity and pumping water, while the aerodynamic wind turbines quasi-represent high technology. There are some operable old windmills too. They can be closely seen in the village museum. Corlejo is the most northern city of Fuerteventura. Its clear water is extremely rich in fish. Therefore, besides industrial fishing, it gives possibility to competition angling. We can also dive here. Furthermore, not only pleasure boats leave for the island of Los Lobos, but also glass floor boats to watch the underwater world. Moreover, ferries to Lanzarote leave from the colorful fishing harbor of Corralejo. Nearly 300 volcanic cones rise on the 800 square kilometer island of Lanzarote. There are hardly any plants on their surface. The soil is formed of solid lava and covered by volcanic sand instead. The huge panes of salt rectifier fields are indicative of human work. The diverse rock formations of the power of nature. The Canary Islands, our volcano peaks and crustal movement, push them up from the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. As the Earth's crust leant along the fault lines, hot rock or magma flew out of the cracks. The members of the group of islands are in different phases of their geological development, the geologists said. One of the greatest sights of Lanzarote is Timanfaya National Park. On the lava field caused by the eruption of 1736, you'll shudder with the fear aroused by erupting geysers and blazing fire in the rock cavities. Diablo Restaurant, designed by Manrique, is a unique experience, where dishes are cooked using the still active geothermal energy. It's better to approach the restaurant, as well as other sites, on camelback. Their hoofs, in contrast to a boot sole, can stand walking on the hot sand. Monumento al Campesino, the 15-meter-long work of Jesus Soto, which stands at the entrance of the Agricultural and Ethnographic Museum, commemorates the life of the peasants. (music) 
Tequisa, which used to be the capital city of the island for a long time, was given its name after a Guanche princess, who was thought to have lived here with the nephew of the conqueror Jean de Betancourt, Colt Macchio. The historic buildings of the city centre are Palacio Spinola, residence of provincial government, and the 15th century eclectic church of Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe. The beautifully redecorated buildings line tidy, flowered streets. It's worth visiting the place, especially on a weekend, when folklore and handicraft exhibitions are held here. The fortress of Castillo de Santa Barbara rises above the city. The white square houses of Haria in the middle of a palm grove inspire oasis of North Africa. The village is a popular holiday resort. Its main square is the shady Plaza de León y Castillo, with the Nuestra Señora de Encarnación at one end. During the academic work of César Manrique, the protection of the natural environment and carefully planned development of the city were most important. Lago Martinez swimming pool in Tenerife and the lookout tower in Lanzarote, Mirador de Rio, which stands at the most northern part of the island in 497 meter height, are linked with his name. Jamenos del Agua truly reflects the artist's attraction to multifunctional buildings and water. It's a system of natural underwater cavities and caves, where Manrique created an underwater restaurant and concert hall. The cave system and the salty lake in it are linked to the sea, so we can see the flux and reflux in it. However, that's not what it's famous for, but for its unique acoustics which make it ideal for holding special concerts. On the surface, a specially formed swimming pool planted around with tropical plants has been created. Arequipa, the capital city, is a commercial center that has very little to attract tourists. Its sites are confined to a fortress and a church named after the patron saints of the city. But the coastal promenade planted with palm trees is also alluring. The Castillo de San Gabriel fortress was built on a little island and can be reached via a long suspension bridge. Puerto del Carmen, with its surroundings north of the capital city, is a real tourist paradise with 
gorgeous fishing harbors and long sandy beaches that hide into the calm cuddle of rocks. Let's have a last glimpse at these ever-shining islands that are so colorful and fascinating with their diverse landscape as if they were separate continents. 